Hello, Lighthouse Fort George. Uh, welcome uh, to our service again, and a special welcome to you today if you happen to be a mom. Happy Mother's Day. Now, would you pray with me as we come to God's Word? Heavenly Father, uh, we thank you that you are the God who loves us. Uh, you've loved us uh, in lots of ways. You've loved us by giving us moms. Uh, we're thankful for that. Everybody's got one or had one. Uh, and Lord, we're thankful that you're the God who speaks to us. And we're hungry now to come to your word and to, to hear your voice speak into our lives. We come from uh, all different positions and places and experiences, but we all come before one God. And we acknowledge right now that we're hungry for what it is you have to say to us. So come Holy Spirit, fill our place. In your name we pray. Amen. Have you ever been frustrated by Jesus' patience? Like, uh, are you ever amazed at Jesus' ability to wait to answer your prayers or help in your need or heal in your sickness or change your circumstances or, or restore your relationships, e even when it would obviously bring glory to His name if He did? Is Jesus way better at patience than you wish He was? Today we're coming across a passage of Scripture that uh, is definitely a Sunday school curriculum uh, for, for every denomination. Uh, it comes across as this happy story, a kid gets healed, a kid gets raised from the dead. And yet, if you actually read this story, it's not a happy story at all. It's an awful story about Jesus being patient at the expense of someone who needs Him. It's awful until you realize how awesome Jesus is. If you've got a Bible with you, I go ahead and grab it and open it to Mark chapter 5. We're going to pick it up in verse 21, and uh, if you are able, would you stand with me in respect for God's Word? Hear now the Word of the Lord. Matthew, uh, sorry, Mark 5, starting in verse 21. When Jesus had crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue leaders named Jairus came, and when he saw Jesus, fell at his feet. He pleaded earnestly with him, My little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she'll be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. A large crowd followed and pressed around him. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She'd suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had. Yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. Because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I'll be healed. Immediately, her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. At once... Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and asked, Who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding against you, his disciples answered. And yet you can ask, Who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who'd done it. Then the woman, knowing that she, uh, what, had, uh, what had happened to her, came and, came and fell at his feet and trembling with fear told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. While Jesus was still speaking, some people came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Your daughter's dead, they said. Why bother the teacher anymore? Overhearing what they said, Jesus told him, Don't be afraid. Just believe. He did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. And when they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw a commotion, people crying and wailing loudly. And he went in and said to them, Why all this commotion and wailing? The child's not dead but asleep. But they laughed at him. After he put them all out, he took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him and went in where the child was. And he took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha kum, which means... Little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately, the girl stood up and began to walk around, and she was 12 years old. At this, they were completely astonished. He gave strict orders not to tell anyone, to, not to let anyone know about this, and told them to give her something to eat. This is the word of the Lord. You can go ahead and be seated. 
Two stories intertwined all together. So this text picks up with Jesus once again on the other side of the lake. And it's actually this whole section, Mark 4 and 5, happens around the Sea of Galilee as Jesus uh, unpacks the dynamics of his kingdom. If you're living with me in my kingdom, he says, this is what it's going to look like. And so Jesus starts out preaching at the beginning of chapter 4 and crowds are crushing in around him and so he, he gets into a boat to avoid the crush of the crowd and then he teaches all day and he's tired and so he asks his disciples to take him to the other side and, and while they sailed he slept on a pillow at the stern. And while he was sleeping all hell started breaking loose. Literally, we talked about how the sea is a picture of chaos and evil and how it was breaking over the gunnels and threatening their very lives. And at this, the disciples yelled out, Don't you love us, Jesus? Don't you even care if we die? And Jesus' response is, I do love you. And I do let the people I love endure the storms of life. Then when Jesus got to the other side, this man full of demons approached him, and we saw Jesus navigate the complex and multifaceted world that we live in, a world of, of both natural and the supernatural together. And Jesus brought healing and wholeness to this broken man in a way that no one expected. And then we get to our passage today. And it's another passage about the power of the kingdom. And actually, if you can believe it, it's the climax of all these climax stories. One amazing story after another, but this is the top. Jesus just doesn't, doesn't have power over nature or over the demonic. Jesus has power over humanity's biggest enemy, death itself. That's the point. But there's actually something more here, something else, something so strange that we'd never expect it or, or even want it, and yet so good. So the passage starts with this guy named Jairus coming to Jesus. He's a, a leader in the synagogue, which means he's one of the big guys in town, and he's uh, powerful and probably wealthy. But in the story, he's not uh, sitting up high and mighty. He's desperate. He comes to, to Jesus in humility. He's got this little girl at home. She's 12 years old, and she's sick to the point of death. Now, in Canada, uh, we take for granted that our kids are going to outlive us. But this actually wasn't the norm in the first century. And uh, one source that I found actually stated that upwards of 60% of children died by the time they were in their mid-teens. 60%. That means that every family knew about death. It didn't make it any less terrible. And so put yourself then in Jairus' family. Imagine the emotional week or, or month or however long it had been as they watched their little girl get sick and then, and then sicker. At the beginning, there was probably hope that she's going to recover, but as we pick up, Jairus knows it's the end. This is her last day. And then he hears that Jesus has shown up in his village, and Jairus runs, and he falls at her feet. Now, this is a leader in the community. Everybody knows him. But he's kneeling down in front of Jesus. That's humility. Have you ever been embarrassed to let people know that you're suffering? Have you ever hid your suffering from people? Well, this guy has passed all of that, and so he, he just begs Jesus. My little girl is dying. My little daughter is dying. Come and lay your hands on her. Heal her so she can live. The words he uses here, my little daughter, are, are very special. They're, they're close words, and they make it obvious that this is his princess. Jairus loves this little girl, and Jesus says, yeah, I, I'm going to come. Now, uh, this is all happy uh, because we know that 19 verses later, everything's going to be fine. But don't steal the power of this text from yourself, all right? So climb into Jairus' shoes the way Mark presents this. What a day! So probably in the morning you'd be grudgingly realized that you were giving your little girl over to death today. This was it. You've already done everything you can possibly do. All the doctors have been seen and consulted and paid and nothing has worked and now she is going to die and you're impotent to do anything except watch. 
But then you hear that Jesus is in town and there's this little spark of hope. But you don't let it get too big because Jesus is a busy guy. He might not even come. Or, or maybe if he does come, there's not even going to be enough time either way. But you run and you beg. And Jesus says yes, and, and the spark grows a little. So maybe my princess is going to make it. Maybe Jesus will heal her. But, but let's go, Jesus. we got to hurry. Let's get through this crowd. How earnestly do you think Jairus is directing people, or Jesus, to his house? Does he just tell him, you know, yeah, it's 1794 Johnson Street, and then he's content to just walk with him as he makes his way? I suspect not, right? He's already got no dignity. His, his knees are brown from begging. I'd be in front of Jesus uh, respectfully uh, shoving people out of the way, right? You with the allergies. You with the dislocated shoulder. Take a Tylenol. Jesus is busy. But to my consternation, look at Jesus. Is he picking up the hint? Is he worried about getting to Jairus' house as quickly as possible? Is he determined? Are his eyes down? Is he avoiding eye contact with people? Are his elbows up? Is he, is he making good time? No, right? He's smiling and lollygagging with the people he passes. He hasn't dismissed the crowd. He's, he's not taking the shortcut. Jesus will not hurry. Stop there for a second. Are you the kind of person who hurries? If yes, why? I, w I don't want to tell you about myself on this one, so I'll just tell you about a friend of mine, right? So I've got this friend who's constantly hurrying from thing to thing, and, and he hurries because he values being on time, but, but somehow he only leaves himself just enough time to get from one thing to the next, so he's constantly rushing from thing to thing, right? L let's just... Uh, judge him together. That's a, that's a character flaw, right? A a and so we'll just judge him. I think he can feel that good. Uh, keep it up for a second. All right. Uh, terrible guy. I'll talk to him about sometime. But, but anyway, it's not good to live like that, rushing everywhere all the time. But there's a time for everything, right? Uh, I've got a pastor friend who told me about an accident that he witnessed uh, uh, down in Vancouver, actually. And uh, uh, this fire truck uh, had its lights on, it was responding to an emergency, and it was going through a red light at an intersection, and this car uh, wasn't paying attention and plowed into the front of the fire truck. A fire truck weighs about 60,000 pounds fully loaded. A car is like 3,000. So the fire truck, well, he knew that this had happened, but he wasn't impacted by it at all. And the fire truck uh, just pushed the car out of the way to the side of the road and then kept on going. Somebody else can clean up that mess. And that's what I want to happen when my house is on fire and my kids are inside, right? Like when I'm having an emergency, I don't want the fire department to work on their mental well-being and live in the moment. I don't want any, uh, anybody noticing the sunrise or smelling the roses. I want the, fi uh, I want the siren. I want the lights. And I want that 60,000-pound truck to just drive through whatever gets in the way in order to get to my emergency. Rush already. And Jesus, he's like a 60,000-pound truck in a lot of ways. He's powerful. He's a storm stopper and a demon kicker. But that's where the parallel ends because one thing Jesus won't do is hurry. Jesus never hurries. And we know he's not hurrying here because he won't blast through this crowd to get to Jairus' daughter. He stops at the slightest interruption. And here's where we get this second story. But don't change characters. Stick with Jairus. So we're pushing through the crowd and people are bumping into Jesus and take, talking about all sorts of unimportant things, right? Oh, the hay fever has been killing me this year, Jesus. A little help here? You know, shh, 
Jesus is busy. Jesus, you're busy, right? Like, remember my little girl? But Jesus will not hurry. He just lets himself be interrupted by this bleeding heart, this bleeding woman. And it is a sad story. She's been bleeding for 12 years. She's spent everything she has on getting better to no avail. So she's poor and she's unclean. She wouldn't have been able to marry. She wouldn't have been able to go into the temple. She, she would have been ostracized by her family. She wouldn't even be allowed to touch people because if an unclean person touches you, then you become unclean. So her life was a living curse. And this woman thinks, if I can just touch Jesus, I'll be cleansed. I'll be healed. But when you're bleeding, you don't touch anyone. <laughs> you sure don't touch a rabbi. And so she sneaks up on Jesus. This is a story about somebody sneaking up on Jesus. Verse 27 says, she came up behind him in the crowd, all right? And she touches his clothes. And her bleeding stops. Now, she hasn't asked for any time from Jesus. In fact, she doesn't even want to be noticed. She just wants his power. And this means that Jesus doesn't have to do anything with her if he doesn't want to, right? So Jesus could just let it go, but Jesus embraces the opportunity to be interrupted. We read, Jesus realized at once that power had gone out from him, so he turned around. He's on his way, but he turns around. Why? Well, there's a hint in the text. Uh, the word power is one thing that comes up over and over again. Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. It's the Greek word dunamai, and we get the word dynamite from this. It's real power to enact physical, emotional, and spiritual change. And this power calms storms and kicks demons. But here... The way it happens is totally unique. It never happens like this ever again. Here, the dynamite goes out of Jesus. That means that he experiences a weakness. His power is in him and it goes out of him. He experiences this weakness in himself and that alerts him to the fact that someone has been healed. So he stops. Jesus stops following Jairus and turns around. But the woman's hiding, <laughs> and so he asks, who touched me? Now, imagine the consternation, right? Mark leaves it out. It's not in the text at all, but I, I could just feel it. Jairus is sweating. He's pulling on Jesus' arms, and the disciples are, are with Jairus in this one, right? Like, oh, oh boy, here Jesus goes again. Uh, most of the time, he's brilliant. Really, really, he is. Uh, but then uh, sometimes he just, he just does stuff, and we're not really sure whether he's losing his marbles. What's going on? Here's what they say to Jesus. You see the people crowding around you, and yet you can ask, who touched me? Verse 32 tells us that he, keep, he kept looking around to see who had done it. He kept looking around. Can you tell that time is passing very slowly for Jairus? Now, he's got no idea what Jesus is possibly up to. Like, why does Jesus even care who touched him? Of course, we know that there's been this healing, but Jairus doesn't know that. But even for us, it's hard to know what Jesus is up to. Like, come on, Jesus. Uh, this woman, she's not going to die. She's, uh, she doesn't even want anything from you. She's already healed. It's done, all right? Uh, she's been suffering from, for years, so even if she was still suffering, she wouldn't die today. This little girl's a little different, right? She can't wait. Woman can wait. She can't. But Jesus waits and gives his attention. To this woman. Do you ever find that Jesus gives his attention to other things or other people around you when you really need his help? Imagine Jairus. His daughter's dying and Jesus says he's going to ha come help. Great. 
But then he couldn't possibly going, be, be going any slower, and now he's stopped altogether. Ah! And Jesus knows what Jairus is going through. And Jesus knows what you're going through. And Jesus is not moved by our frustration. He does not take our feelings into account even when we think he should. Come on, Jesus, hurry. I need your help. But Jesus will not hurry. Isn't that how it happens? Finally, the inevitable takes place. A messenger from Jairus' house comes and says, your daughter is dead. There's no use troubling the teacher now. Troubling him? Who's troubling Jesus? He's obviously not troubled by me at all. I think Jairus has some choice words to say here, but Mark decides we're not old enough to know them, and so he doesn't include them. But Jesus overhears, and he locks eyes with Jairus, and he looks into his soul and says, verse 36, don't be afraid, just believe. Jesus will not hurry for everything, for anything. And it's awful. But here's where we find out that Jesus isn't 60,000 pounds. He's way more than we've ever wanted Him to be. So God's sense of timing often frustrates, doesn't it? Remember back in chapter 4 when Jesus just lets the storm get so big so that they're just about to die? And then the, the disciples say, you know, Uh, what's going on? Don't you care? And Jesus says, I do love you, and I allow the people I love to weather the storms. Here he says, I do love you, and I allow the people I love to wait. Why? God could hurry, right? God could fix the problem now. And because it, he doesn't, it, it feels like he's toying with us to, I don't know, build our character or something. It doesn't feel like love, right? But that's what people think when they only expect Jesus to be 60,000 pounds. But he's not. Jesus is way bigger than we've ever wanted him to be. And so Jesus doesn't say, I won't hurry, but I still love you. He says... I won't hurry because I love you. And I won't hurry because I know what I'm doing and I know what's best for you. So I won't hurry. Don't be afraid. Trust me. Just believe. Three things to take away from here for us. First, when we come to Jesus for help, We always get more than we bargained for. And he always asks for more than we planned to give. So Jairus uh, came to Jesus for a fever cure, not a resurrection. But he got a resurrection. And he came thinking he needed enough faith just to trust Jesus until Jesus could get to his house. But Jesus demanded way more from him. Jesus asked him to trust even when his little girl was dead. That's a big ask. And this woman, she came to Jesus uh, wanting to go through the drive-thru, wanting to to get healed and disappear, but Jesus forced her to go public. She didn't want to go public. It's like if you're ever at uh, one of those uh, charismatic healing services and the the preacher guy uh, says, you know, hey, you in the third row with the impotence problem, (laughs) come on to the front and get prayed for, right? Like, I ain't going up there. Jesus asks way more from this woman than she wanted to give. But he gives her way more than she ever wanted. So just like Jairus, she has a 60,000 pound view of Jesus. She thinks he's magic. She, She thinks his clothes can heal her. It's superstitious. And if she gets away, she gets away with this view of Jesus. And here's what we didn't see. As far as Jairus' little girl is concerned, sickness or death is the same to Jesus, right? We know that at the end of the story. No big deal. 
Raise the sick, raise the dead, same thing. But this woman's soul won't wait. She gets away, she gets away with this view of Jesus. And so this is actually the real emergency. This is why Jesus stops and searches her out. And when she realizes that she's caught, uh, verse 33 says she comes trembling with fear. It was actually the same fear that the disciples had after the storm stopped. And Jesus is just way bigger than she ever imagined. And so Jesus speaks, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Daughter, my clothes didn't heal you. Your faith in me has made you well. Made you well. English actually fails here a bit. This is the word sozo. It means made you whole. And it's actually the word we use for saved. We translate saved you or you've been saved. But this is not a, just a, a spiritual salvation. This is a body, mind, and soul thing. So her body, yes, it got healed. But that's not all she needed, right? She couldn't go into the temple. She was ostracized from God. She was unclean. But now... She's been made whole. Jesus adds, go in peace, shalom, another whole-bodied, whole-life thing. And so she ends up in this story healed and holy. She ends a disciple because Jesus stopped. That's the miracle. Friends, when you come to Jesus, and He wants you to come, with whatever's on your life, in your life, in your situation, He wants you to come you got to know that you're always going to get more from Jesus than you asked for. And He's going to ask for more from you than you ever intended to give. But it's because He loves you and He knows what's actually good for you. Second thing to take away here, something even bigger. And it's tied to these twelves and this strange weakness that Jesus experienced. So the the girl is 12 and the woman suffered 12 years. These are are weird details, right? Or maybe not. So 12 is the number of God's people. There's 12 tribes, there's 12 disciples. And so with these numbers, Mark is preparing us to see something more than this simply being a story about two people who got healed by Jesus. This is a story about every one of God's people. So God's kingdom is for us. This is about us. And, And His kingdom is about flipping the world right side up in a way that we would never have imagined. So these people come to Jesus. One is a man and one is a woman. And it's a patriarchal society. And one is powerful and, one, and religious and the other is weak and excluded from the temple. And one is rich and one is poor. And if these two people showed up at your door, it'd be an honor to help one and an embarrassment to be seen with the other, let alone touched by her. But Jesus is the God who flips the world right side up. And he wants to flip your world right side up as well. And this isn't just a one-off thing. So Jesus is constantly contrasting the insiders with the outsiders. He's demonstrating that his kingdom isn't what we would expect. Constantly, it's women over men. It's poor over rich. It's the sinner over the religious. It's racial outcasts over true Israelites. And every time, without exception, Jesus puts the powerful in their place while extending grace and mercy to the weak. This is a message that our world needs to hear. Our world has rejected Jesus, and it has no idea who the Jesus is that they're rejecting. It's this Jesus who loves the weak and powerless. Why? It's because Jesus isn't 60,000 pounds. If you're big, you save by muscling through, and then you make yourself bigger by saving strong people and having them join your team. But if you're infinitely bigger, and there's just no point in, in flexing, there's no point in bolstering your team. And we see this at the end of Mark. You see, Jesus saves, but not by getting strong. He does it by being strung up, naked, embarrassed, and exposed. He saves not by killing his sinful enemies, but by taking the sin of his enemies upon himself. And this is the way that his kingdom works. 
with Jesus, the way up is down. The way to get power is to serve. The way to a great life is to lay it down. The way to be clothed in righteousness is to let God know that you don't have any. Jesus saves then by becoming weak so that we can be made strong. That's how big he is. And that's where he takes this woman. And because this is who he is, when Jesus is slow in answering, it's not because he doesn't love. It's because he's bigger than we think and doing something totally beyond what we have any idea about. When Jesus doesn't act in our timing, we're prone to say things like, you know, okay, you know, sure, you're the God of the universe, you built this place, you built me, but but why should you know better than me about my life? But he does. And he has something bigger to, to give, so much bigger to give than we even knew to ask for. Friends, Jesus loves you. And he lets the people he loves wait. And then when you've waited to the end, Jesus looks you in the eye and says, don't be afraid. Just believe. Trust me even more. And so finally, third takeaway, Jesus gets to Jairus' house and the people are weeping and wailing and he puts them all outside and he goes into this 12-year-old girl's bedroom and he takes her by the hand and he just speaks. Just like with the storm, just like with Legion, and the biggest enemy humanity has ever faced releases its grip. Death has to let her go because Jesus is way bigger than 60,000 pounds. But Mark gives us some details here. Jesus calls the woman daughter, and here he takes this girl's hand and says, Talitha Kum. It's actually a pet name. It doesn't translate super well, but it's like saying honey, Talitha, or princess. And it actually parallels the way that Jairus has spoken about his little girl. It's obvious that Jairus loves his little girl, but Jesus speaks to this girl in death's clutches just like a dad speaks to his little princess every Saturday morning when it's time to get up. Princess, time to get up. Friends, Jesus isn't heartless or insensitive. He loves like no other, and He's working to give more than we ever thought we needed, even to the point of becoming weak Himself. Friends, Jesus lost His Father's hand on the cross. He died in our sin. He went into the tomb so that we could be raised out of it. He was crucified outside the city in uncleanliness so that we could be made clean. He lost the Father's hand so that we could know that when He has us by the hand, He will never, ever forsake us. He loves us. So for whatever you're facing, don't be afraid. Jesus is bigger than you've ever wanted Him to be. I'm not sure where you're at right now, what you're struggling with, what you need to trust Jesus for. Is there something going on in your life that you don't understand? Whatever it is, Jesus wants you to know, to see that he's bigger than you thought he was. Way bigger, so much bigger that he can see beyond what you can see. And he waits because he loves you. Will you trust him? Heavenly Father, thank you for coming into this broken world to walk with us. To show us that you are a relational God who doesn't just control the universe, but you love us. And so I pray right now that that you would come and that you would open our eyes eyes to see you in a fresh way, and our hearts to receive you. I just pray if there are people here who need to receive you or to trust you, either for the first time or, or again, that you would come and that you'd speak into our hearts. Help us to believe. In your name we pray. Amen. Bless you guys. Have a great week.